Hello, everybody. Today we are doing a stream on how to use alcohol inks to draw food illustration. If you would like to grow as an artist and you can't afford an art class, we've got everything you need here at ArtProf, critiques, tutorials, and professional development. Let's talk art supplies for a little bit because these are all alcohol inks, which honestly, I have never used these before. I have used alcohol-based markers, but this is a completely different thing. This is the wild west of alcohol markers in a way. And I want to say thank you so much to Marker Universe for providing the alcohol markers that alcohol inks, rather, that we're going to be using today. And if you go down to the video description below, you will find lots of links and information that they have provided. This is a specific brand called Sketch Marker, and it was founded in 2016, and it's one of the leading art brands in Russia and the Ukraine. Therefore, we have all this cool graphic design <laughs> on this box. And I honestly thought that these were marker refills at first, because if you buy Copic markers, you can buy refills to fill up the markers when they run out. But this is like pure ink. The difference is that it's alcohol based. So let's do a little bit of experimentation so you can all see how these work, because I just I want to know what I'm getting into before I actually start doing something with this material. Tell me in the chat who here has used alcohol based inks before and who here has only used alcohol based markers, because this is a totally different experience than the markers. And one of the things that Marker Universe recommended to me was to use alcohol based ink on Yupo paper because Yupo paper is very slick. It does not absorb the ink. And so the ink can run across the surface. So let me show you what that looks like. And this is intense ink. Okay. So you probably, if you're worried about it, I suppose you could wear gloves, but they stay in your hands a lot. Okay. That's, that's really intense. I, I was not kidding when I said this is the wild west. Ooh, look at that. Let me zoom in. And then all of you can see the textures a little bit better because it's really quite remarkable how sensitive the ink is. And oh my gosh, it dries so fast. That's crazy. I just dropped in a whole bunch, as you saw, and some of it's already evaporating. That is really crazy. Okay, let's try a different color and see that difference because, wow, I was, I was not prepared for that speed. All right, so here's an orange one. So let's just really put in like a puddle. And then you can see how intense that is. Oh my gosh, it's already like alive. <laughs> I feel like I'm using, I don't know, cultured alcohol ink. Oh my gosh, that's so bizarre. Like I didn't do anything here and it's already growing. I feel like this is bacteria ink or something. Try this out. I mean, I could imagine, especially if you're somebody who maybe works abstractly, this is probably a sweet deal. Because, wow, look at what you can do with those bleeds. That is really crazy. Yeah, like I haven't even touched it. And it's already doing all these crazy things. Sorry, I feel like I'm just woo, watching this pretty little movie that's happening on my paper. And now the other thing you can do is, you know how with watercolors, you can add water to change it. You can do the same thing here, but with isopropyl rubbing alcohol, which is basically alcohol that you just get at any pharmacy. So what I did is I just put it in this little container. And I do think that this is really handy to have because the alcohol doesn't smell great, and I would advise if you're doing a lot of this that you do it with a window that's open. 
But I also have a container here with a cap. And so that means while I'm painting with it, I can put the cap on so I don't have to breathe the alcohol ink all the time. So let's see what happens if I dip my brush into the alcohol ink. Oh, cool. So you can re-wet it. All right. So this is like gouache. I wonder how far you can re-wet. Like, I wonder if you can actually get it to the wide of the page. Let me see if that happens because for me that really does make a big difference so let me just see how much i can wipe away with a rag okay it looks like when the ink has had a chance to dry that you can't get it to pure white but if you catch it while it's still wet you can get rid of it quite a bit but wow that is that is really intense. All right, so I would say this is a material that has a mind of its own. <laughs> if you want absolute dictatorial control, this is not the material for you. Then again, maybe it is. Maybe you need to learn how to give yourself into the process a little bit more. But I'm excited because this is so different. And markers, I think they do give you so much control. And so having a material like this, where you really have to be okay relinquishing that is a pretty cool experience to have from time to time. ConCube is asking, I wonder if it would still reactivate on a regular paper. Let's find out. I have here a sheet of watercolor paper. This is watercolor paper over here on this side. And actually let me mark it so everybody can tell. So this is watercolor paper here, and this is the Yupo. Okay, so let me just start by putting some of the ink. Oh boy, that just went, it just sucked it up immediately. You see that? Like I put it down, and then within like half a second, it's already in the paper. So actually, this is good, I would say, if you want to do something that is very graphic. I mean, you could certainly do something like this, but I wonder what would happen if I tried like a wash with the rubbing alcohol. I don't know if that is gonna work. I don't know, it might just soak it up right away. Oh, I guess it did a little bit. Okay, so let's say in theory, I could take some of the paint that's over here and I could paint here, but yeah, it just sinks in right away. It's just like, Copics, like I've used Copics on watercolor paper and it soaks in, but you know, what's fun is you can blend with it pretty well. So if I wanted to do multiple washes on top of this, I totally could. But yeah, th this is not remotely the same thing as this. I mean, two totally different experiences depending on the paper. And I would assume that regular drawing paper is something similar. All right, let me go back and take a look at some of your comments, because I'm curious if anybody here has any tips for how to use alcohol ink. I am all ears. I've never used the supply before, and I'm excited to see how it's going to function. Jazz says, don't touch Yupo paper with your fingers much because the oils change the way the paper works. That's a great tip, Jazz. I, of course, discovered that the hard way. <laughs> that has happened many times. So yes, try to keep it fairly well protected. Dylan says, I guess this alcohol ink can dry up like acrylic paint. It dries almost right away because I guess the concept is that the alcohol in the ink just evaporates immediately. So that's different because acrylic does take a little bit of time to dry. It's a different type of rhythm, but I think that this seems like it has a ton of potential, which I'm excited about. Well, welcome, Christina. I'm so glad you could join us. And this is a great tip from Jazz who says spray bottle with rubbing alcohol in it, spray from a distance up and you can get a cool spattery effect. Oh, that's a great idea. Oh, I'd love to try that. 
Jane is saying, I was going to ask about absorption. Those are cool effects for sure. Not show sure what I would do with them though. Well, here's the thing. Tell me in the chat who else does this as well. <laughs> Every time I get a new supply that I don't know anything about, I'll just do a Google search, image search of alcohol inks, and I'll just see what pops up, okay? And I'm curious to know if people have had this experience as well, that um, there are certain materials, it's like people expect them to be used a very specific way. And I'm like, really? There's a lot of other ways <laughs> you could all be using these materials. And yet somehow, when I looked up alcohol inks, it was pretty much across the board abstract work. There was nothing that was representational at all. And it was all being used on Yupa paper. And it was all being used in this flowy way, which I totally get. I mean, obviously, this is the alcohol inks special talents. It's very good at this. But I guess one thing that I was curious about was, OK, this is sort of like a wild beast of ink. It, you can't control it. It's really, really hard to control. And so how would somebody like me, who is not an abstract artist, go about getting it to fit into my practice a little bit more? And so my first impulse is always mixed media. So what I decided to do here is I just started this quick sketch. And by the way, if anybody here wants to draw along with me, the link to the reference photo is in the YouTube video description below. So if you want to work from that, you're totally welcome to. This is funny because it's a bread fairy image, but there's no food. Like, <laughs> that's, I'm thinking that's pretty funny because most of them have food. This is that moment before the food gets served, which I love as a narrative story. So yeah, typically it's super vibrant, flowy, abstract images. And I thought, okay, being the rebel that I am, I don't want to use it like everybody else. I want to see how I can try to manipulate this a little bit more. So I think what I'm going to do is I started this colored pencil sketch. It's not remotely there yet, but I think before I do more on this, I'm going to just start adding some alcohol ink and I'm going to try moving back and forth between the two, depending on how the alcohol inks behave. Because it could be that maybe I've already done too much with the colored pencil. And maybe I'll find that, oh, I'm going to need way more. And so I'm just partnering up the alcohol inks with the colored pencil as a assistant. <laughs> oh, this is a good tip from Ray. An eyedropper works well for keeping odor locked up. Excellent. And Rowan Beth says, check out Ula Thynel. She uses alcohol inks as base layers in her fantasy art. Oh, that's a great idea. Also, Carrie Ann says you can use dip pen. And Jazz says you can dye polymer clay with alcohol ink too. It's so much fun to play with. And also, Razin, dude, I am so glad <clears throat> you are all here to do the tutorial for me because, wow, my uh, streams are a lot easier when the audience is giving me all the information. Okay, so let's just do some very quick experiments. I don't have any expectations for the piece that I'm doing today because. This is just playtime for me right now. This has nothing to do with trying to make anything, quote unquote, look good. And because it does dry so fast, it absorbs so fast, I'm just going to put a big blob into this little container. What I have for the little containers is I have like a little lid here so I can put that on top when I'm done. OK, so I'm going to start with some of the lighter sections. And I'm using a Sumi brush, as always, because I'm a weirdo. And I never like to use art supplies for what they're <laughs> made for, apparently. And this is something I do a lot with ink wash, is I always have a scrap sheet of paper on the side so I can test out exactly what's going on. Sometimes you think you have a lot of ink, but you actually don't. And this is actually pretty dark. So actually, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to add a little bit of rubbing alcohol to this, like maybe just a couple drops in here. And this will be some of my palette. So now I can sort of create some more washes here. All right, so let's try this. Let's just see what happens. I mean, I don't know where 
this is going to go. I'm just going to make a mess. <laughs> I do think what's very helpful for a lot of people is if you decide in advance, I don't care about this artwork, it makes things a lot easier. Does anybody here do that? Or you say, okay, this is my sacrifice painting. This is the painting I have no expectations for. I don't know what's going to happen and whatever. That's fine. Oh, and by the way, these colored pencils that I use to do the line sketch, these are water soluble and the alcohol is not totally getting rid of them, but they, they are being affected. So that's another thing to consider. I mean, another thing I could try is the water-based, the not water-based Karen Dash pencils. All right, so that's a quick fill-in. It's quite dark down here at the bottom. I'm just going to go all in. <laughs> Let's just make a really big mess. Oh, that is very yummy. <laughs> nice. Oh, geez. So this really does retain the strokes, but the thing is the strokes don't really do what maybe you want them to do. I have an idea for how I can deal with that. Because while this is great for abstract stuff, I, I do like trying to see, okay, well, what about for people like me who are control freaks and want to really dictate a little bit better and have more control over what's going on? You'll also notice right now, I am very much limiting myself to one color. That's just because I'm trying to figure it out. And eventually later on, probably I will be adding some more colors. But for now, I'm just trying to keep things simple. I just find that when I'm trying new material, I have no idea what's going on. It's just like way too confusing to try to do so many things all at once. And I am trying to paint fairly abstractly right now because I'm just more concerned about the bigger shapes. I'm not that worried about the individual articulation. Basically, just make a mess. It's so much faster to make a mess and just clean it up later. And honestly, this is good practice for me as far as keeping a big picture view of what's happening. And you can see up here, I had done some blocks of colored pencil because I was thinking, oh, I will need those. But I just painted over them because I just realized, you know what, I sort of like how crazy intense some of these dark passages are. And if you didn't already know this, I will stop every now and then to read comments. I'm not going to do it while I'm painting because you know what? Painting and talking is enough. <laughs> you don't want to read comments at the same time. All right. Yeah, just big shapes. Like this chair in the back is pretty significant. Okay, I'm just throwing in like this shadow is pretty strong, just the big stuff. Oh, gosh, I totally forgot. about it. There's this like huge shadow that the pitcher is making. Ooh, that's really fun. And then even these like wrinkles that are coming over here. You know what this reminds me of? It, it's almost like those brushes that they have in watercolor in Adobe Animate that are really fun. This is actually a little bit too saturated, so I'm going to pull down the saturation of my webcam just for a second, and that'll look a little bit better. Okay, I'm actually going to just fill this blue because technically, I suppose... I guess the image like ends here. So actually, maybe I should just do that instead. Okay, so you know what? So I don't get confused. I'm going to take a rag and I'm going to take some of the rubbing alcohol. I mean, I'm curious to see what the rag does anyway. Ooh, that's, that's kind of beautiful. Look at that. You know what this reminds me of now? This really makes me think of monotype. For those of you who are part of the printmaking community, doesn't that look so much like a sheet of plexiglass 
where you rub away the ink with a rag, it looks so much like that. And that actually makes me think because it's Yubo paper that maybe I can almost treat this like a monotype. That That's sort of getting me really excited now, actually. <laughs> like, okay, if I can make it more printmaking, like that's going to feel just a little bit more familiar. And maybe there's potential there for me to use it in that way. I am finding though that I have to squirt the ink out fairly often because it evaporates so fast. You can't squirt out a big amount because it just evaporates. So I'm just finding I have to go back and do that fairly often, which is fine. So that's just a tip you want to be aware of. Oh yeah, and there's this like lighter shadow back there. I guess the thing that's tricky about this is that it it lifts itself back. So if I go in here, I'm just adding some quick little spots in the window, but now I'm going to immediately take it away. And I guess that's a good way to get some lighter washes because I don't want everything to be this dark. It's a little bit much. So actually, now that I've overworked it a little bit, actually, let me darken this whole section in the front and then I'm going to go in with the rag and we'll see what happens because I'm, I'm very curious to hear about the monotype thing. And if anybody has suggestions for things you think I should try with materials, just let me know. Okay. All right. So we're going to say to be clear that that is going to be the edge of my image. Okay. All right. Cool. Let me see what people are talking about in the chat. Jazz says, add isopropyl alcohol to the ink pot to rehydrate it. Oh, Jazz, would you like to do this tutorial for me? You seem to know a lot about this. <laughs> so let's try it. All right. It's got the alcohol. Let's see what happens when I rehydrate that. Because yeah, that's a pain that it, it just, I mean, this is going to evaporate. It's just, I have more of it now. So I just want to see. Hmm. Yeah, that's pretty good. Okay. I like that effect. See, I don't like how textured this is. That's not really my cup of tea, but that's why I'm going to try some stuff later on with the rag. That's a good question. Le Croissant Arts. It's not Jim. <laughs> this is called Clara was too busy yesterday and forgot to change the thumbnail. And then after I tried the alcohol inks, I was like, shoot, I can't do this image. This is not going to be a good fit. So I picked this more monochromatic one because I thought it would be better and didn't change the thumbnail. So yeah, this is not Jim. <laughs> this is not you imagining things. Jane says, I think the way alcohol evaporates so fast scares me a bit for alcohol ink. I think it's just different than what you're accustomed to. It's a different rhythm. And so one thing that I like about each material is that because they all behave differently, I behave differently. And then oftentimes I will discover ways of working that I normally would never do on my own. And I like that a lot. I think that can be actually very exciting. Christina says, alcohol inks make a gorgeous background wash. Nickel Azo Gold is one of my favorite ways to prime a canvas or paper. I just love that we all talk about Nickel Azo Gold here. It's just, it's the best, nerdiest art community online. I don't know. Maybe I can't claim that status. <laughs> maybe there are other art communities nerdier than ours, but I don't know. Have some of you seen the art supply conversations in the Discord, they are very impressive. I just love that. We are all like that. And Jazz says, you need isopropyl alcohol with 90% or more. Yours is only 70%. Oh my goodness, you are really paying attention. Okay, well, noted for the future. Okay, let's go in with the rag because I'm just like super curious 
to see what's going to happen with that. Okay, so I'm going to need this to be here. And I might go back and do some more colored pencil, but I think I do want to do a pass with the rag first before that happens. And then I can just keep moving back and forth. Okay, so if I... Oh, you know what I want to do? Actually, okay, I take it back. Before I do that, if you look at the reference photo, one thing that I think is really, really helpful. Oh, you know what's nice? This is like a good little practice spot here. Okay. One thing that's really helpful for me is to identify, okay, where are the spots in the painting that are pure white, absolute brightest white? And it's funny, you might think it's the window in the background, but it's not. The window in the background actually does have some very light tints. And so I'm going in now to essentially remove all of the straight white. And actually, same thing with the picture, that the only straight white is at the top. There's some at the bottom. And even this glass, which seems like it should be so bright, is not. And this is all gray. So what I'm trying to do right now is I'm going through the whole piece and anything which is not absolute straight brightest white is gonna get filled in. Because if I don't do that, those areas of white are not gonna feel so special. Like up here, it doesn't make sense that this is pure white. Like this is actually very dark. So just to make the relationships better in terms of that, that's gonna help me a lot. Okay, and actually, I think this side on the left, I'm just going to put straight ink here because I want it to be like really dark. Okay, yeah, this stuff is, <laughs> I suspect I might need to live with this on my hand for a little while. That's fine. <laughs> I've gone multiple days with Sharpie on my hands. Okay, so I have now essentially canceled out anything that is not like super bright white. Okay, now let's go back in and let's start to lift out some areas. I mean, this is a huge mess, but you know something? I find it easier to clean up a mess than to try to make everything look good from the get-go. So I'm going to pull out, like, there's this side here. And actually, you know something? I also got these Q-tips. So I'm curious to see how these are going to work. If it lets me pull out areas a little bit more detail, this is still a little bit wet, so I might I may need that area to dry a little bit more. You know, what? I'm going to hold off on the Q-tips because I think right now I got larger shapes that I want to do. But this is fun. I mean, I'm able to clean up a little bit some of the marks that I had. Hmm, weird. This one is not... That one's not really coming out that much, but that might not be a bad thing. So let's see if I can do, actually, maybe the Q-tip will do it here. So I'm going to take the Q-tip, I'm going to dip it in the alcohol, and I'm going to see if I can pull out this little edge up here. Okay, so I did a pass with the... Ooh, it's pretty fun. I mean, now that I'm thinking about it, if I were to do what I'm doing again with the rag, I think probably I would work a little bigger because this is a little bit small for me. I'm not somebody who works well <laughs> on a small scale, but it just might give me a little bit more space to move around some more. And let's see how it does if I want like a softer gradient. So I'm going to come in here and like massage it a little bit more. Oh, weird. Isn't that crazy? Look at what's happening over there. What is that? I kind of like that. I mean, that really looks a lot like painting. And actually, let me try this too. I'm going to take the ink, I'm going to put the ink on the rag and let's just paint like that. Oh, that's kind of fun. You can actually really see the strokes. Ooh, I think
think I like that. Let's use that to build up some of the shading. And actually this shadow I think could use a lot more because here now you can really see the strokes very well. Wow, that is a horrible mess. <laughs> It's fine though, that's what you have to do. When you're learning a new material, you have to be willing to make something that looks really bad. Oh, like that's fun. See how that's really starting to lift now? I guess it, re it really has to be wet because if it's not totally wet, it's not gonna lift enough and then it's like not really worth it. So what I'm trying to do right now is articulate, there's the shadow that's coming from the picture and then there's this like little streak of light that's coming back there so i'm trying to get that to show more and then maybe it's hard with the detail stuff okay like this is more a shadow that's like around the plate this is so similar to monotype see all they needed was to put the alcohol ink into the hands of a printmaker. See what we can do, printmakers? We are we are so powerful. <laughs> who's a printmaker here? I just I always need to know who's a printmaker because just we, we, you have to find your people, right? Okay, so this is getting to be a little bit richer, and I'm finding that I'm doing better when I have more ink on the surface. And so in some of these places, I'm, I'm going to dump it on and wipe it around like this. Because actually, I have to say, I think out of all the tools that I've used so far, the rag is my favorite one. I'm sure I'll find ways to use the brush and stuff later, but I, I really like the rag. This is so far the tool that I think is really giving me the control that I would like to have. It's all about control, I'm such a control freak. Okay. Yeah, because the thing about this image, okay? I'll tell you a little backstory on this. Obviously these meals and wonderful gatherings at the bread fairy, my mother-in-law creates they're so beautiful and it's like for her it really is an art form like setting the table is an art form this is not random i mean i think most of us can tell that there's a very specific color scheme that's happening here but what captivated me about the scene it's not just the place setting it's the lighting does everybody see how beautiful that light is the way the light is coming in from that window and the way it's passing through the picture there's just so many things here that I love about that. And so ultimately, in my opinion, the point of the scene is light. Sure, it's about the objects that are here and all that, but the light is really what makes the scene what it is. And so even if I come away today with a really sloppy painting, as long as I have captured the light, that's all I really care about. That's much more important to me than anything else. So that is my goal with this image, if I give myself a goal, because obviously I'm trying a lot of things today. All right, let's see what people are saying in the chat. Rowan Beth says, I'm impressed at how much rubbing that paper can take. You know what it is? I think it's because the Yupo paper that I have, it's pretty thick. This is Yupo medium, but they have another one called Yupo heavy that's almost like cardstock Yupo paper. So this isn't even the thickest type of Yupo paper you can get, but yeah, it's amazing. And it feels good. Like it's a really nice, soft, almost silky surface. I mean, the first time I touched Yupo paper, I was like, whoa, <laughs> like it felt so good because the thing about other harder materials like say acetate they just feel very plasticky like this doesn't feel like plastic to me it really feels like something that has a little bit more of a softness to it
Jane is saying, Clara, did you just dye your finger? I, I would say I dyed all my fingers. <laughs> I don't care. If it bothers some of you, though, you can wear gloves. That'll definitely take care of it. Jazz is also recommending felt pads. And AA says, is layering easy with drawing inks? Well, the thing about drawing inks, I mean, it depends on the surface. That depends on the type. But yeah, I mean, inks to me are the most effective as an art material when you layer with them. I love layering everything. I layer with charcoal. It just makes things easier for me as far as building the structure of what it is that I'm trying to draw. Comcuke says it really is similar to monotype with the rag and Q-tips. You keep giving me reasons to buy Yupo. I'm resisting it like a toddler resists a nap. <laughs> wow, that that is, you are determined because those of you who have kids, toddlers and naps, mm -mm, it rarely works out. Jane is asking, are there any other papers that work well with this ink besides Yupo? I think anything like Yupo. For example, you probably could do it with Mylar, which is also not an absorbent material. I'd be curious to see if it worked on, say, plexiglass or even glass, I think would be very interesting. Anything that doesn't absorb, I think would be fine. Tom Cuke says, these seem like they'd be great for illustrating light, like neon lights or glow worms. Well, I don't know when the next time I'm going to have to draw glow worms, but I will know now what I need to do next time. <laughs> Brittany says, have you tried going back in with straight alcohol on the brush? Interested to see if it would lighten the darker areas just now popped in, so I don't know. Let me try it because... I haven't done it recently. I was doing a lot with the rag before. So let's see what happens. What I'm seeing so far, though, is that the more that's on the paper, the easier it is for me to deal with. Because I just found that earlier on in the stream, when I had all those white spots and stuff wasn't filled in, I found it much harder to deal with. This is easier now because there's so much pigment, I can actually move it around and model it. Okay, straight alcohol <clears throat> with the brush. So let's do straight alcohol, which is here. And I'll just do it in a spot like here so you can see better. Okay, yeah, it reactivates. And I guess in theory, I could do that. Hmm, that is really cool. All right, I'm going to fill that back in because that's actually an area that I want to be pretty dark. And it does get pretty dark. I mean, that's pretty intense as far as value goes. All right, I may need to go in and do a little bit of colored pencil work because it is starting to get really, really muddy, but I want to spend a little bit more time with the rag and just modeling around the areas. And by the way, if you want information on all the art supplies and information from Marker Universe, the links are in the YouTube video description below, and we will also have this on artprof.org later on. Okay, time to squint. It's always time to squint, in my opinion. <laughs> Especially if you're working on a scene like this, and you're really trying to show a feeling or a sense of light, that's really going to help you. Because when you squint, you don't see details. That's why I squint, because if I don't do that, I just end up picking at things left and right, and that's generally not a good thing in my opinion. Okay, this is that little piece of highlight that I was trying to get earlier, and I do want to make, you got to press pretty hard, by the way. I'm not being really fragile with this. I, I really am scrubbing, and the Yubo paper is doing great. I mean, it really is not harmed at all by that surface. Why does this stupid fork have to be so awkwardly lined up? I, I don't like that. I might just cheat and <laughs> like not deal. You ever do that when you have the reference? You're like, I don't like that. I'm just not going to do it. It's great.
And I guess I'm also trying to be very conscious about edges. Like I'm asking myself, okay, when do I like the harsh graphic edges? When do I like it to be smoother? Like here, I'm just rubbing the whole background in because I want this background to be like very, very soft. And actually, this is very dark. So let's just toss the ink in there. And I'm just going to pick it up with my rag and fill in this spot here, this side of the handle. Move that around. Because I, I like the idea of making this background just make it a little bit more atmospheric. I think it's a little bit too harsh right now. How's everybody's weekend going? I stayed up way too late last night and now I'm paying for it. You know what though? It was worth it. <laughs> you know why? Because uh, I discovered that Benedict Cumberbatch is in this film called August Osage Country. Has anybody seen this? It's got Meryl Streep and Julia Roberts, like a million really famous movie people in there, like Chris Cooper and Ewan McGregor. And I was like, okay, is this movie worth watching for Benedict? Because, you know, sometimes you're like, oh, I want to watch this because they're in this movie. But it's like, then you watch the movie and they're only in the movie for like 10 minutes. And it's a bummer because that's why you wanted to watch the movie. I was like, okay, this is worth it. But it was one of those nights I was just like, oh my God, I'm so tired. And I know I should go to bed, but I really just need like, the mental rest more than I need the physical rest, even though I'm really tired. So I was like, okay, I'll stay up and I'll watch this movie. And it's true, he was not in it for very long. He did not have a lot of screen time. But you guys, he was so cute in this movie. And he sang a song and he played the piano. I was like, oh my God. And he's like really adorable because his character is this really sad character who has a very demeaning mother who puts him down and he's had a really hard life for that reason he's just like really cute in this movie like you just you just want to like i mean i always want to hug him but just want to pick him up like a little puppy dog he's so adorable in this movie and it's a good movie i mean it's a really well-made film and it was actually a play first i forget what the name of the playwright is but it does have that play like atmosphere which is fun i mean it's a nice change of pace from what you typically see so i highly recommend that movie and also if you're a cumber person <laughs> and so yes i'm very tired today but i'm like it was worth it it was worth it to watch benedict play the piano and sing a sweet little song Oh, I just feel so bad for him. I mean, he definitely did his job. It was so different than Sherlock, where he's just such a jerk to everybody. And in this film, you just, oh my God, he was just so cute. <laughs> By the way, thank you so much, Jill Kama. We greatly appreciate your support. We need all of your support as much as possible. We are doing the best we can with what we have, but I'll tell you, it, it frustrates me so much that when people ask me, oh, can we do this? I'm like, yes, I want to. I want to. I just don't have the budget to hire the staff that I need to help do certain things. If I could have it my way, I would hire the TA so they could all be in the Discord every single day. We don't have the budget for that right now, but I hope that we do someday. So keep it coming, guys. Those super, super stickers. Okay. More squinting. I'm going to do a little bit more with the rubbing alcohol. I just want to drive home the lighting a little bit more. And then I think I'm going to go back and pick up a couple spots that I think might be helpful in terms of getting the lighting to be better. I might try to, I don't know. The thing is like, once you lift it, it's hard to get it back. I don't know, which makes me wonder if maybe, I'm not sure. 
because here's the thing i'm more into the more blended tones i tend to not like the super washy stuff i mean i like some of it but i like it more in moderation i don't want that to be the vast majority of what the image is it, it depends though i mean it so depends on what type of effect you're all trying to make okay let's go back and do some more work with the colored pencils and i think what i'm going to try to do is just spruce up a couple points hi beth in greece oh i would love to go to greece i bet greece is amazing all the incredible temples and oh my god i just i love that ancient greek architecture hellenistic greek period is just the bomb if you don't know what i'm talking about look up ancient hellenistic greek sculpture one of my favorite sculptures the old market woman oh my god love hellenistic greek sculpture yes jane i did cheat a little bit i did a little bit of sketch in the beginning but mostly that's so that the stream doesn't end up being five hours <laughs> for your sake and for mine as well oh jazz says i tried alcohol ink on ceramic tile that sounds awesome i feel like you could do some amazing things with that and sentient trent says i've done watercolor on photo printing paper it's very glossy but also is somewhat sticky it's an interesting surface oh that sounds amazing i bet you could get some super cool textures with that And Jazz also says wedgie foamy makeup sponges are great to move the ink around too. There's also a company called Pan Pastel. We're actually going to be doing a feature with them, I believe, next month. And they have these sponges that are like makeup sponges, but I actually like them better because they're formulated specifically for doing pastel work. And you'll see them later in a stream eventually. But I remember at one point I tried makeup sponges. And at least for me, they, they weren't quite what I wanted. I mean, I wanted something really specific. I'm sure it would work for some people, but it depends. Sam is asking, are drawing inks similar to India ink? They're similar. The way I would describe it is India ink is a little bit more intense. It tends to get better coverage. It tends to become opaque faster. I find a lot of drawing inks, they're a little bit thin when I compare them to India ink. But again, it really depends on the brand. Some brands, the India ink is not good. Like I would have sometimes students at RISD would bring in India ink and it was so bad that they like could not use it. So you have to make sure you get fairly good quality. Otherwise it's like, it really is not good. Thank you so much, DPG, for the super chat. We so much appreciate your support. Philippa says, need to work on a project for university that's all about interior spaces. Do you have any suggestions of cool rooms to draw and paint? I don't want my boring house. Well, if you have a friend who maybe you could go chill in their dining room for a little bit. I think a lot of you saw the Oma bread painting. I basically parked myself in her dining room for an entire day. But the other thing I would also remind you, Philippa, you might think your house is boring. That, that's everybody's assumption is that their house is boring, right? Because you live with it every day, you see it every day. But if you stop and you look closely, you might actually find that there are little pockets in your house that maybe you don't take the time to look at that maybe could be really great for a drawing and so one thing you can try philippa is if you get a viewfinder you just get like a piece of cardboard you just cut a little like window in the middle walk around your house holding that viewfinder so you are literally like walking around framing little pockets of space and that could be a way to see something because the issue i think obviously setting up at a friend's place you can do that but it's like it's not as convenient so sometimes 
being able to do something at your house can be very helpful. Odette says, just tuning in, got my son to sleep. Oh my God, such a win. I'm so happy for you. <laughs> Parents here, I think we understand what a big deal is when our kids finally fall asleep. It's great. W315 says, how do you know if an India ink is bad? Usually if I try to do like a straight, flat black area of ink and it's a little thin, like it's not full opaque black coverage, that's usually a bad sign. Or if I try to turn it into gradients and maybe the gradients aren't easy to get because the paint is too thin, that's another reason. Okay, let's do some color pencil work because I'm just curious, okay, this is a little dry, if I can sort of resurrect this because of the mess that I made. And this will be interesting because a lot of people who watched my stream where I, I did draw the jam, <laughs> the one that was all colored pencil, that it was so interesting to me. There are so many comments, people saying like, wow, I'd never seen anybody draw with colored pencil like that. Like, I think a lot of people, the stereotype, I guess, of a colored pencil drawing is that, oh, you have to have like really, really sharp pencils and it has to be very photorealistic and it's very slow because building up the color oftentimes is not something that you can do quickly. And I, I certainly do not build to the degree that some people do with color pencil, but I guess people were really surprised by that, how different that was. So yes, I draw like a barbarian. Yes, that's what it comes down to. And you know, if people don't like it too bad, I don't care. <laughs> I don't care. People who are over the age of 40, isn't it great not caring what anybody thinks? You're just like, I don't care. It's fine. My kid who is, well, one of them, who is 12 said to me, mommy, how can you not care what other people think? I'm like, it takes way too much energy to care about what other people think. And it's life is so much more fun when you don't. So yeah, I may be a barbarian, but I, I like being a barbarian. <laughs> Plus, do the barbarians win? <laughs> do they go around just conquering stuff? I mean, yeah, that's not very nice. You really shouldn't go around conquering and destroying villages. It's not very nice. I don't know. I have this thing. I really like stuff about empires. That's why I like Greece. That's why I like ancient Rome. I mean, the Romans were nuts. So who here has been to see the Pantheon in Rome. Tell me in the chat if you have seen that because, oh my God, like a lot of times you go to these buildings and it's like, yeah, that's amazing they built that. Yeah, cool, right? <laughs> but freaking Pantheon, they're so insane. Like think about the level of technology that they had in ancient Rome was absurdly low. I mean, what did they have? Like a couple hammers and the ancient Romans are like, we're going to build this crazy huge building and we're going to pour concrete over this wooden mold. And then we're going to take the wooden mold away and we're going to have this beautiful opening called the Oculus in the center that brings in this ray of light. It's like, how, how did you even begin to think that this might be possible with the technology that you own? Like when you think about it, Modern architecture today, probably because we have safety regulations and don't want everybody to die when they're working on the building. It's like, you think about the insane risks that they took to build those buildings back then. And it just blows my mind. Like Gothic cathedrals. I took a wonderful art history course when I was at RISD as an undergrad about Gothic cathedrals. And it's like some of these cathedrals, some of them were not finished in an architect's lifetime. So a cathedral would start with one architect 
And then another architect would have to pick it up because that architect died before it finished. It's like, are you insane? Like, who here is in Europe or has been to Europe and has seen a Gothic cathedral? There's so many in France that are, oh my God, amazing. And tell me what that's like, because there is nothing like that on the planet. Like, wh why? why? Why did you all think this was a great idea? And then there was that horrible thing that happened at the Bourges Cathedral. It collapsed when they were building it. Can you imagine how terrifying that must have been? Just like these stones falling over you. And you think about, this is in like, what, the 13th century? This is so long ago. I'm sure they like barely had scaffolding. I mean, it's insane. Some of the stuff that they did to create these buildings, it just blows my mind. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do, see, I really lost, this cup makes me sad. I did not do a good job with this cup. So I think I gotta bring back some of the shadow here. I mean, I guess my thought is that the, Alcohol inks for me, they they sort of throw down a feeling of tone and then I clean it up or I, I pick parts with the colored pencil that I want to emphasize. So for me, this technique is a way to get like the looseness of what you get with the alcohol inks, but then I can also have like major control, like this section I'm doing here, I really can dictate exactly the size that I want that to be. And the colored pencils work great on the Yupo paper. It feels wonderful. In fact, it's easier. It feels softer. Like, you know how sometimes the colored pencil, it just feels like it's a lot. But this I actually like quite a bit. And I do want to be a little bit bolder. I feel like I've been a little wimpy with my colored pencil so far which is why I really like this particular colored pencil. It's called Magnus. It's Faber-Castell's Albrechter Magnus colored pencils, and they're really thick and they're great when I just want to like fill because I don't always want to do something detailed. A lot of the times I, I do need something that just can fill something in. And this also, because it's so blunt, does everybody see, I'll show you on a sheet of paper, if I want to do like a fairly soft stroke, like for colored pencil, that's pretty soft. Like most people colored pencil does something more like this, but I really enjoy how rich that can get. Yeah, I'm just gonna let it fly here because this is stuff that really does not have the contrast. Like I totally lost all that contrast getting into here. Right. And that helps me like beef up some of the passages that got a little bit too thin. And then I love stuff like this, like see these little wrinkles on the side? Because you know what? Cloth is never as flat as you would like it to be. <laughs> I mean, if I like really spent time on this, I, I could absolutely go in and start adding even more of these wrinkles. I'm starting to do a little bit of that here, but it just gives the cloth a little bit more character, which I really like. And then this plate should probably be a little bit more dramatic. I mean, I got a little lost in the details here, but that's all right. This is actually a really cool table setting she did because this is very monochromatic. I mean, I think a lot of you have seen a lot of the other bread fairy drawings. It's like very ornate and like a million patterns. And so this was sort of a, I guess, departure <laughs> for the bread fairy, which I really enjoyed. So that's why I was so captivated by the scene because oftentimes, yeah, the main event really is the food the vast majority of the time. But in this case, the food wasn't even there yet. And yet there was still so much personality and character to this area. And it's cool, the, the color pencil, it's not perfect. Like it, it definitely has a lot of flaws here, but I'm kind of loving that about this. And 
I don't really want this to be so liney. So what I'm going to do right now, I'm just taking a, a nice soft side of my color pencil. And I'm just putting it over the areas where you can see the line really well, because I don't like how harsh those are. I'm trying to make them a little smoother. Okay, time to squint some more. And I really want to just bring these shadows back because I totally got lost. All right, let's see what people are saying in the chat. And then I'm going to try to tackle this stuff in the distance and a little bit down here at the bottom. Red Blunt says, watercolor pencils or regular? These are watercolor pencils. And honestly, it's not because I wanted them. It's just what they were sitting around. <laughs> Do people ever notice it's like half the time your art supply choices, they're not that intelligent. Sometimes it's like, oh, I couldn't find the other one. So I guess I'll use these. I mean, sometimes it's just really that silly. <laughs> Christina says, I was going to ask if the gloves would strictly be for keeping your hands clean or if there's a health issue. I don't think there's a health issue. I did not read anything on any of the packaging saying that you couldn't put it on your hands. I'll have to look at the Marker Universe website later, but I did not see anything that said that. Oh, another tech tip that Marker Universe told me is that this technique with the alcohol inks, once they dry, they told me that they will chip off or peel. And so the recommendation from Marker Universe is to get a water-based spray sealer and to spray it over the piece later on. So know that because I know people are always concerned about preserving the works and not getting them scraped up. Philippa says, never went to Rome, but I will one day for sure. For now, I have Portuguese architecture, which is also amazing. We are old. <laughs> There's some amazing churches. You know, who else is in Portugal? Michael Fassbender lives there. <laughs> he lives in Ibiza. See, everything comes back to my men. <laughs> Ariel says, Clara, could you just download all of your wonderful art knowledge into our brains? I'm trying. It's all in my head. I just have to put it down on paper. I mean, that's why I'm working so much on those curriculums, the, the curriculums for self-taught artists. I'm trying to really put some serious time into getting those as organized as possible. I'm working really hard on the tracks that we have on our website. If you don't know what the tracks are, it's a structured sequence of video lessons and assignments. And it's basically our response to people really wanting to know where to start because we've gotten wonderful feedback on our curriculums for self-taught artists, which is so terrific to know that we're helping people that way. But then what happened was a lot of people said to us, oh my gosh, we love these curriculums, but there's so much information here that I don't even know where I should start can you tell me where to start? And then I said, oh my gosh, I got to write this. <laughs> so I've written tracks for a couple of topics so far. So right now, if you go to rprof.org, there are tracks available. They're free. There's a painting basics track. There's a drawing basics track. And I just put together a track for people who are preparing art school portfolios. So the idea is the curriculums are there as a reference, like a little library. But if you want to be told, oh, learn this first, then do this, and then do this assignment, it just takes the thinking away for you. Because it, it is distracting to be like, well, should I learn color first? Or is anatomy more important? Or should I do? It's like you could go crazy thinking about all that. And honestly, I'm just taking what I did at RISD and I'm just writing it down. <laughs> like, it's not hard for me to come up with the content for the trucks. That's actually the easy part. The part that takes forever is putting it onto the website, getting it organized, doing all the writing. That, that takes a really, really long time. So that's extremely time consuming. And that's where I wish I had more administrative staff. You know, I wish I was more than just me working on the website because the website's a ton of work. Um, and I want the website 
to be more comprehensive than it is. It's not remotely as full as I would like it to be right now, but working on it. And I'm hoping that our budget will continue to increase with donations. It's tricky though, because as much as we have people who join who are new, and that's so important to have that, we always have people that leave as well. So it's hard to make progress in terms of donations because there are always people sort of coming and leaving, which I know is part of it. I mean, not everybody can support at certain times. I mean, people's life situations change. I totally get that. But from our point of view, it's an ongoing challenge because you're, you're constantly just needing to address that. Like it never really goes away. Okay. So I sort of like how sketchy those are. And then this one in the background, oh, these glasses are driving me crazy. Like I did one with oil pastel. It was not a stream with just me. It was a live stream studio hangout. And I did a drawing on mineral paper from these uh, oil pastels that I was using. But I had just gotten started with this. And so now I feel like I'm revisiting it. I feel like I know it a little bit better. So that's pretty helpful. So actually, I'm going to accentuate. Does everybody see this wrinkle that's going down the middle is actually a pretty important wrinkle. I mean, you wouldn't think it is. But actually, what this wrinkle really does is it's giving you linear perspective. I mean, I didn't really talk about this, but there's lots of linear perspective in this drawing. The whole table has linear perspective. And it's one point, in case you're wondering what it is it that you're looking at. And so if you have linear perspective here and here and here, this line down the middle, it really, really helps. And actually, now I'm like paranoid that it's not <laughs> lined up. I'm not going to take the time to measure it right now, but I will later on when I have the opportunity. I still feel like this is a little bit too bright. Let me just do a quick pass. And you know something? Somebody said in the chat that it's so blue. And you know, so I wasn't playing on that, but I sort of like it all blue. I don't know, because that, that really was the essence of the setup, is it, it really was pretty much all blue. And I sort of like that about the scene, that it is monochromatic. Because that really is the essence of the scene. I mean, sure, it's not all blue. There's plenty of other colors in there. But in my eyes, it may as well have been blue. You know, it's like it was so blue that it pretty much was just blue. So let's just stick it like that. OK, actually, let me take a minute. And I need to shave some stuff off my colored pencil. So you can see this colored pencil, it's like really beefy. It's like a very powerful colored pencil. And I just know if I used a very thin, skinny one that was very sharp, I, I could not do what I'm doing. And it's not even about speed. It's like the type of mark that this is making for me right now is, is so specific. All right, I do want to hint like a little bit of the blinds back here. I'm not going to do a huge amount, but just a couple strokes here and there to indicate that it's not totally empty. I'll do more later. Probably what I'll do is I'll just get everything to a fairly decent point, and then I'll go in and I'll work on it after the stream, and I can show you later what that looks like, because I am liking this technique. This is pretty fun. Okay, and so now here it gives me the opportunity I can go back and really get this like nice soft sliver of highlight. So getting back to what I was saying about the tracks, I believe the next track I have on my list is a, a digital art track, like people who have never done digital art before, how to get started with that. As somebody who very recently experienced that. <laughs> I, I, I think I have a lot to say about what skills I think you need and how to go about learning digital art. I know a lot of people want to be able to do that because especially the certain industries, like you, you just really have to 
like concept art. I think you all know Jordan is having to, I mean, his stuff is like all digital. Oh man, and I messed up this ellipse. This ellipse is not good. Okay, we're just gonna leave it like that for now. I just wanna block in this one napkin is just like so dark. It's, it's like literally one of the darkest parts. And then this is also crazy dark. And here, I'm gonna do a little bit of work with the Q-tip because what I'm thinking is that maybe the Q-tip can like lift out a little bit of this rim. Ooh, that came out pretty good. Let's see if I can lift that out a little bit more. Yeah, that did come out pretty cool. All right. I just wanted that lip to show a little bit better. I might just take out that fork. I feel like that fork is kind of in the way. And again, maybe I'm just chickening out. And then maybe I'll lift a little bit in this plate too, because I don't want this to get too, too dark. All right. Now see, this is actually fairly dark. I, I think that this whole area, I need to just darken this whole section. Just make it come down because like this is the crux of the shadow that the cup and the pitcher are making. And those are pretty important in the scheme of things. So I don't want them to go untouched. And it's cool because the alcohol ink creates a certain type of texture. The color of pencil does something a little bit different. I don't know. I'm like a really big fan of mixed media. Who here likes mixed media? Because it's almost like you can use the strengths of each material, but then not have to deal with some of its weaknesses. Like Julia Ben Bassett, who did our creature design tutorial, she did it using ballpoint pen and watercolor. And she said that the thing is, if you do all ballpoint pen by itself, it takes forever because it's just very slow. And she said, same thing with watercolor. If something is all watercolor, it does tend to take a while to fill in and do all that stuff. But then if you put them together, it's like the watercolor fills in while the ballpoint pen takes forever to do. And then the ballpoint pen can really pull out some of the details that really would take forever to do in watercolor. So it's sort of like a team effort where you just, you're, you're using the best skills from each of the materials. Well, I don't know what happened back here, but uh, <laughs> I'm gonna, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to draw a chair back here. I might just leave it out. It's maybe not even necessary because of what else is happening back here. see. All right. Let's see what people are saying in the chat. Pavel says, this painting has really transformed from the beginning. I mean, I think that all artworks, there's a learning curve. And I think that at the very least, even if I don't like the way things are going, if I'm just trying new stuff and saying, well, what about this? What about that? Eventually you'll get to something, you know? And so I think the larger issue is when people don't do that and they just keep doing the same thing all the time, then it makes it difficult to really learn something from that piece. And Com Cuke says, I haven't worked monochromatically in years. Now I really want to get back into it. Know any good monochrome artist? Mark Tanzi. Oh, I love Mark Tanzi's stuff. Here, I'll put his name into the chat because you may not know how to spell it. Epic monochromatic paintings. Oh, they're amazing. And I saw some of them in, in real life. They're huge. There's this one Mark Tanzi painting. I think it was like 15 feet wide. Like none of his paintings are small. So check them out. Oh, yes. So I did try mineral paper and I really liked it. It's like Yupo, but it feels a little bit closer to paper. Like to me, Yupo feels more like plastic compared to mineral paper. So it's almost like 
if UPO paper and regular paper had a baby, it would end up like mineral paper. It's great. I, I just love all these different combinations. Paparistic says, do you have any of your ex-colleagues who wanted to be part of ArtProv? I would love to see another art professor to demonstrate live and to observe different approaches. Love the Rose video with Kathleen. Oh, I want to so bad. I'll be honest, it's a budget issue. We just don't have the money. We can't hire them because when people teach at the college level and let's say somebody like Kathy Spronza, who has been around for so long and has so I, I cannot pay her nothing. She she has to be paid a significant amount. We just don't have the money for it. So I'm hoping that if we get a bigger budget and get more donations, maybe we can do it. But right now it's just not feasible. We just don't have the money. And I, I can't ask people to work for free. I just think that's kind of insulting. So anyway, someday help us with the donations because that that's the difference. It's just, do we have the money to hire people like that? Thank you so much, Happy Heretic, for the super sticker. These donations, everybody, they add up and they do make a difference. And let's see what else people are saying about mixed media. This is funny. Odette says, mixed media feels a little bit like cheating to me, but I know it makes no sense to try to make life more difficult for myself. In the end, it's also about the results and perhaps less about the process. It depends. I mean, it can be. Some people do not care about the process. Some people really like the process and don't care as much about the product. It's so specific. I think whatever works for you. I just think that if there's an easier way to do something and it's not harming anybody, like I... I cannot think of a lot of reasons why I wouldn't do that. There is something to be said about just using one media because I do think it changes your mindset because you can see I had color pencil sketch. I did the alcohol on top. I'm going back in with the color pencil now. It's like my brain is shifting based on that reaction. Now, if I had just gone in straight watercolor with no change, that is more linear because you're more familiar with the same material and you're working with it more independently. But th there is something to be said about having those different changes as you work on it. Sometimes those can be really, really helpful. Happy Heretic says, I'm Christina from over on Facebook. Come over here so I could donate. I've been watching you for so long. I'd love to contribute more often. Well, thank you so much, Christina. We greatly appreciate that. And what I would suggest to everybody is to help us reach our Patreon goal. We're not that close right now. I know it's a bummer. I really wish we were closer. But what we need is ongoing support because the one-time donations Oh my God, they're fabulous. They're so important. I know not everybody can do monthly, but we need to get a stronger base on Patreon to make sure that we can cover all of those ongoing expenses. So everything's important. I'm not saying nothing is, but it's like we need stuff that's coming in every month because the issue with sponsors is oftentimes, um, I never know month to month. It's, it's no guarantee that I'm definitely gonna have sponsorship. So yeah, all that stuff really matters everybody because I don't wanna set up a paywall. I do think that this is a lousy business like model. I don't recommend it to anybody, but uh, I, I think it's helping a lot of people because tell, tell me in the chat, actually, if you weren't here, where would you be getting your art education? Would you pay for a class online? I'm sure there's other YouTube channels, of course, that all of you watch, or would you be taking a class in real life? I know some places have started to open up now. But I, I just think there has to be an option for pe people who want the quality and the no paywall thing. And honestly, I sometimes wonder, I'm like, maybe it's a problem that we're free because people sometimes think, oh, if it's free, it must not be as good. And I do worry about that, to be honest, because I know sometimes people, 
I do this myself. I do this all the time. You know, when you're like searching for a pair of headphones and you're looking at it and you're like, okay, well, this one's $50. This one's 150. This one's 200. And you're like, well, there's got to be a reason why that one's 200 and why this one's 50. There's got to be a reason in terms of quality, right? But the thing is, there isn't always, you know, sometimes people just have ridiculous prices for things for no reason. And I think it's the same thing. Oftentimes with online education, people will look at stuff and they'll say, oh, your site is free. It must not be very good. Or, oh, wow, this course that people are offering, it's so expensive. It must be really good. And I don't think that's always the case. So I sometimes worry that maybe the free part of our program has hurt us in that way in terms of how people see us. I mean, I would hope people would give us a chance and you know, watch us before they make that decision. But I do think that sometimes that, that is very easy for people to fall into. I get it. It totally makes sense to me. I do it myself. And I confess, I have gone on to Amazon and bought something and bought the more expensive one because I thought, oh, it must be better. <laughs> it's not always better. So yeah, it's really, it's challenging, isn't it? So like, sometimes I think, oh man, if we had a paywall, maybe people would respect me more, <laughs> but I don't know. <laughs> I'm not talking about all of you. I'm talking about like the greater world. Although sometimes I think academia was just so lousy that I just think, you know what? Those guys are never going to like what I do ever. I really think this is totally true. The only way I could ever get academia to give me the respect that I think I deserve. I'd have to win a MacArthur Foundation grant. If I won that, yes, they would all come crawling back to me. But anything else, I don't think there's anything else I could do. Like if I became a billionaire, which is not going to happen, they would just be like, oh, you sold out, right? Or if, I don't know, I, I got my show sold to HBO for 3 million, they wouldn't care either because they would still say, oh, you're a sellout. But if I want to make Arthur Grant, okay, they would shut their butts and I would rub it in their faces. Sorry, can you tell them a little bitter? <laughs> I know it's really petty. It's extremely childish, but I kind of can't help it. It's just, I don't know. You get treated so crappy for so long, you start to believe it. I'm sure everybody here has had that experience where it's like, you don't think you're doing a bad job, but because nobody acknowledges it or because um, nobody says anything positive, you just are like, well, I must not be doing a good job. And it's like, you really start to drink the Kool-Aid after a while. It's really not pretty. So yeah. I'm so glad I'm here with all of you. So happy to hang out with people that really are here because they want to be and not because they are trying to get a letter recommendation or because they're trying to get um, an internship or they're trying to get on. So on. it's like you guys are here because you want to be here. And that to me is so valuable. And there's nothing like that. Like I've never been in a place where it has been that clear cut why people are here. And I love that about this community that nobody's here other than because they want to be because i would have students like i taught at RISD and wellesley college and a couple other places and we have these like midterm reports where i would just tell people hey here's how you're doing you know so if they're like really having a hard time they have enough time that they can actually change what they're doing in the class to make sure they don't fail or you know whatever but Oftentimes that, that really wasn't the reason that people wanted those updates. I would have students who would come in and they'd say, what do I do to get the A? And I'm like, okay, how about like learning because you want to learn or because you're interested? It wasn't about that. It was, how do I get the A? And it just depressed me so much. So I just love that we don't talk about how to get the A here. And I love that people are here because they want to be and that you're learning because you want to, not because you think you should or because you think it'll get you a job. I mean, yeah, that's fine if that's part of the package, but I think for the most part, people are here because they want to be.
Dana says, art school is limiting. I've done my best work out of art school. I love the art professor. Well, I think that's inevitable, though. I don't think there's any art school that exists that could ever give you what you need all the time. You could go to a great school and have a great experience. And I did. I loved my undergraduate art school experience. And there is still so much stuff I had to learn. And that's not the art school's fault. That's just the way it is. But it's true. Art school will only take you so far. And I do think oftentimes, especially because now it's art school admission season, a lot of people put a lot of weight into the school. Like, oh, well, if I go to the school, will I get this? And I'm like, maybe, but maybe not. Like, like art school is not going to do it for you. You're going to have to do a lot of other things besides art school to get the things that you want. Rachel says, fine education as well. Ask their students to get really expensive products. I totally understand that good quality makes it better to use, but I think there needs to be a compromise. Yeah, what I try to do is to give people options. Like I say, hey, if you've got money to burn, buy this. It's great. This is a little bit in between. And here's if you really have no options at all. That's what I try to do because we do serve people of so many different backgrounds here. And I just want people to have options. That's another reason why with a lot of our content, you'll notice we'll do like the live stream. And then later I'll cut like a three minute version of the live stream so that the people that want the live stream can have it, but the people that want the summary can get it. And so that's what I'm trying to work on. Oh my God, it's taking forever. (laughs) It's just giving people as many different formats and options of our content so they can pick the one that best represents and fits their learning style. Because some people love the long-term thing. Other people don't have the time. Other people learn better through text. And so that's what I'm working on right now. It's just, it's very time consuming. So, <laughs> Tony Spring says, wanted to go to art school for decades. I'm glad I waited and found art prof. I'll tell you, I think we're in a really seismic moment for education because a lot of the things that i thought about art school for so long they're sort of imploding right now and i think the pandemic was a huge part of that for sure but i think now that the shock of that initial transition of the lockdown has worn i hopefully fingers crossed but i think now people are starting to step back and say wow there, there's There's that lot here that we didn't tap into before. So Ellie says, I think the fact that you have the credentials and stated your purpose on your website made me realize the quality of education you provide. Well, good. I mean, we try to be transparent because there was a website that somebody was telling me about. It was sort of similar, like online art education. I went to the website. And I always click on about because I just want to know. And I couldn't find a single name of a person who taught on the site. It just was like, we do this, we do that. And I'm like, yeah, but who are you? Like, I couldn't find any pictures of the staff. And immediately it made me want to leave because it just didn't feel like they were being upfront about who they were. It just felt a little bit opaque. And I just got a little suspicious. So I think... Presentation is the tricky part of teaching online because what I was saying earlier about the live streams versus the summaries and the shorts and stuff, basically what I'm doing all day is I have all these boxes and I'm like, okay, here's a cute little red box. Here's a big corrugated cardboard box. Here's a pink ribbon. Here's a white ribbon. And it's like, which ribbon and which box (laughs) is going to be the best fit for you? And I'm trying to just stock our shelves with all these different boxes with sizes and ribbons and saying, hopefully a couple of these work for all of you. So we would see. (laughs) Bit Maskable says, if I hadn't found you, I'd still be paying for lessons online. All of those I've done have been lower quality than your instruction. The Patreon streams especially are invaluable. Well, I'm so glad that that has been the case. Well, everybody, I hope that you will hang out with me and the Art Prof Discord, I will be in the post live streams channel. So come show me what you made, chat, talk about 
Benedict Cumberbatch because he's all I seem to be thinking about lately. It's really bad. I have a problem. Thank you so much to our top Patreon supporters. We are so grateful that you are here to help us provide a free art education to everybody. Thank you so much for hanging out with me. I'll see you next time. Bye.